We will, we will now reconvene in open session. The time is 4.03 p.m. For the record, in compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, no votes were taken or decisions made in executive session. <coughs> At this point, let me thank um, Dr. Kibler for your hospitality and hosting us. It's always a good time to be here on your campus. It's such a, a beautiful campus, and we love, uh, we love being here, and we love the weather, of course. So, um, except I understand it is raining outside. So um, because of that, we're going to take uh, an item out of order, and I'm going to ask Dr. Kibler to make a presentation um, and introduce um, some special guests who are with us this, this afternoon. <coughs> share with you the remarks that I was going to share over there at the site briefly at this point. And uh, so Chairman Salazar, members of the Board of Regents of the Texas State University System, Chancellor McCall, fellow presidents and members of the system staff, and all others that are members of the Sol Ross family and friends and colleagues, and we have some here from our Alpine community. We're pleased that you're able to be a part of this. We're particularly honored to have Zuzu Burke's parents and her brother here with us. So Glenn and Lori Burke are here, and her brother Miles is here. <laughs> Suffice it to say that this amazing young woman had a tremendous impact on our university community and family. As most of you here know the Zuzu Burke story, but that impact was evident, was never more in evidence then she, when she was here with us as a student, the compelling part of this story is that the impact that Zuzu had on all of us and continues to have on us after having been taken from us. Members of the board, you'll recall that I came to you with an unusual request in May. I asked you to approve the naming of a facility on the Sol Ross campus after a student. That's not a typical request, but Zuzu Berg was anything but a typical student. Your unanimous approval of that request was most appreciated then, and today we're here to close that circle. With thoughtful input from her family, the words on this dedication plaque that you see the image before you capture, as well as any, who Zuzu was and is. Her words are first on the plaque below her image as she describes her passion for nature that drew her to this land. She interned for the Davis Mountain State Park and decided to pursue studies in conservation biology. And as she says, she packed up her car and her dog and the rest is history. She describes falling in love with the Natural Resource Management Program at Sol Ross and all the opportunities that it provided for her. She concludes with these words, every day that goes by, the terrain and wildlife remind me of how beautiful this frontier is and how truly lucky I am to be here. So I wanted to share with you just briefly, you may or may not be able to see them on your image, the words that are on the plaque, because they were carefully selected by her family in the way that they really reflected comments from friends and others and acquaintances and her family as to who Zuzu was. Chaplain Ray Bullock said this, hers was a wonderful life. I'll pause for a second and let you know for those of you that remember the movie, Zuzu Burke was in fact named after Zuzu Bailey in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. So that's why Chaplain Burke's, uh, our Bullock's comment uh, is fitting. Hers was a wonderful life. Paste my smile on your life, paste my passion in your hearts, paste my beauty on your behavior, paste my dreams into your goals. 
Fellow student and close friend Mark Black says, she was aware of the sanctity of life and the importance of living life to the fullest. Zuzu's disappearance brought this community together in ways that are almost unheard of. Alpine Police Department Officer Aaron Villanueva spoke on behalf of all in law enforcement that were passionately engaged in the process of finding Zuzu last year. He said this, Zuzu has made a huge impact on our little town and the Zuzu effect has taken a life on a life of its own. Glenn Burke, and Glenn will speak to you in just a minute, Zuzu's beloved father said this of their daughter, no one is poor if you have friends. Zuzu is the richest person I know. She loved this school and this community, and you loved her back. She will always be remembered, referring to hashtag FindZuzu, the social media hashtag that spread the word of her disappearance. We did find her. It is my prayer that we continue finding Zuzu in our hearts, always, and forever. I had the opportunity to speak at this memorial service as well, and my my one quote is on the plaque where I shared about her. I said, our spirits have been lifted by all that she meant to so many. She was drawn to the majesty and the wonder of this land. And then there are two quotes from Zuzu herself that were among her favorites. She said, I want to follow summer all around the world. And then she also said, every great action starts with a small idea. And lastly, these words at the very bottom from the book of Isaiah were selected by Zuzu's family as a fitting closing. How beautiful are the on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. Small joys usually emerge from tragedies. One of our joys has been to get to know the Burke family as part of our own family here at Sol Ross and in Alpine. One of the assurances that I and others gave Glenn and Lori and Miles is that the Sol Ross family would always remember Zuzu. And so dedicating this special place on our campus is one of the ways that is assured. And now I'd take, like to take just a second. Glenn, Zuzu's dad would like to offer just a couple of things. Thank you. Hello. Uh, to have Zuzu's name attached to this beautiful place uh, bestows a great honor upon her memory. And it's a source of pride uh, for us, her family, and to everyone who ever knew her. Uh, the choice of this location um, befits her in that um, it's an outdoor place. It's natural. This is where she loved to be. And it's also a place of learning and a place for fun. So our family will be back again and again to visit and uh, relive our memories of her here because we feel such a strong connection to her here in this place. Thank you for what you've done. It is so special for us, our family, everyone who knows you. Just in conclusion, the question might be asked, although Glenn already answered it for some for some, why this place? This outdoor amphitheater is a new feature on our campus, where we transformed what used to be a parking lot into something amazing. In so many ways, this place represents all that Zuzu loved. It's a place outdoors. It's a place of outdoor learning. It's an outdoor gathering place. If you were there right now, you would look before you where you're looking, and you'd see a range of mountains. And then we'd ask you to turn around and look behind you, and you can see all this tomorrow morning, and you'd see the Davis Mountains. So you can see the mountains from both ways. The Davis Mountains that drew Zuzu here to begin with. The very first uni university event held in this place last spring was the memorial service for Zuzu, where hundreds gathered to pay tribute to her 
to hear her life story, enjoy, enjoy her love of music, and bask in the glory of the majesty of this land. So this location is already a part of the lexicon of our campus. As you hear students say, meet me at Zuzu's place, or let's gather at Zuzu's place. That's their shortened version for what to call this. It's just Zuzu's place. So Zuzu's place, now officially known as the Zuzu Renee Burke Memorial Amphitheater, is now dedicated and named and has become part of the enduring legacy of Sol Ross State University. And I thank you all very much for your support and encouragement in getting this done. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Dr. Kibler, when you brought this item to us in May, I thanked you and I want to thank you again because it's, the, it's an honor for this board to, to be able to recognize um, Zuzu in this way and we thank her family for being with us today. Thank you very much. Um, yes, sir, but before you stand up, I'd like to introduce um, another new person among our midst. It's my pleasure to introduce our new student regent Ms. Caitlin Tyra, who comes to us from Sam Houston State University. Tyra, or uh, Ms. Tyra has been extraordinarily involved inside and outside the classroom while maintaining a 4.0 GPA in accounting. Uh, Caitlin has been involved in many things on campus. She's one of eight student ambassadors for the Center for Law, Engagement, and Politics at Sam. And as president of the LEAP Ambassadors, she has traveled to more than 70 states and represented the LEAP Center and the University well at more than 100 events. So we welcome you, and we're very glad you're with us on Thank the board. And now, Dr. McCall, we're ready for your remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to talk a bit about the state of the system, the future of the system, hurdles ahead, and how we hurdle. We have a good story. We're a significant employer. This system and its component institutions employ 15,000 people in Texas. <clears throat> I'm on the wrong slide. Mike. You're looking for me. There you are. Mike. There you are. Mike. Mike. You're there now. <clears throat> there. We employ two thirds more. Texans than Texas Instruments, two-thirds more people in Texas than NASA, and we employ as many people as British Petroleum, Centerpoint, and Lockheed Martin combined. Our institutions provide an outstanding return on investment. According to an economic study done in 2014, the Texas State University system, I think the batteries I didn't do a test run. <laughs> we spent about $600 million in payroll and <coughs> benefits and $533 million on goods and services and added $8.1 billion in income to the Texas economy directly and indirectly. And this is equivalent to more than half a percent of the gross state product of Texas, or 118,000 new jobs. And this doesn't even take into account the quarter of a billion in construction we're doing right now, and the 29 million annually in heat funding. We're doing all this despite the fact that we are underfunded compared to other systems in the state. And in fact, the average state appropriation per student across the six university systems ranges from $7,400 in the A&M system to $5,300 in our system. In other words, the state of Texas values a student in the A&M system $2,100 per year more than a student in our system. Our three largest institutions, Lamar University, Texas State University, and Sam Houston State University, are among the lowest funded institutions in the state on a per student basis. 
We expect to see some differences based on each institution's mission and the mix of degree programs they offer. What we shouldn't see are the wild variations in the value that the state assigns to students at one institution <coughs> compared to another. For example, the state of Texas values a student at the University of Houston 28% more than a student at Texas State. The state of Texas values a student at UT Tyler 45% more than a student at Sam Houston State. And a student at UT Permian Basin is valued 72% more than a student at Lamar University. This shouldn't be. Our two-year institutions are working to train and educate the workforce in an important part of the state, which contributes enormously to the Texas economy. In this respect, their mission is the same to the community colleges. But unlike the community colleges, they receive no local tax revenue. As a result, their funding on a per student basis and on a contract hour basis is less than half of what the average community college receives. Accordingly, I'm going to ask that we have as a high legislative priority that I work with Dave Phelan, Mr. Creighton, Mr. Nichols, to correct this problem this next session, to ask the state to appropriate for our two-year schools more in line with what community colleges get. Here's a look at the source of our operating <coughs> revenue system-wide. 26% of our revenue comes to the state, a 13% reduction from a decade. As the state's share of operating revenue has declined, the student share has grown. Tuition and fees now account for 39% of the total revenue. More than half of what we spend system-wide, 55% supports the salaries and benefits of our 15,000 employees, the faculty and staff and administrators who are critical to the success, success of our institutions and students. I'd like to point out that the second largest expense category is scholarships. We spend more to help students buy down the cost of education than we do on utilities, maintenance, and interest combined. At this point, may I congratulate our presidents with regard to their fundraising efforts in this regard. Endowments are up 89% since 2010. The Texas State University student aren't the students of a generation in the past. Our average undergraduate is 22 years old. 20% of our students live on campus. Two out of five receive Pell Grants, and more than half receive financial aid in one form or another. 58% have taken out student loans. 68% of our students are considered at risk, meaning they require some form of intervention in order to succeed academically. 72% work, and more than half are first generation students. In short, our student population requires a bit more attention than just holding the door open for them when they arrive. The average student faculty ratio in our system is 24 to 1, higher than the state average of 22 to 1. Lamar and Sol Ross are less. Going forward as a strategy, Lamar and Sol Ross must grow their population to the average or make cuts. This is gonna be hard. We are, compared to other university systems in Texas, a bit more crowded. You'll see from this chart that we have, on average, 75 square feet for every student, 23% less than the state average. Our fastest growing campuses, we simply cannot and will not be able to build classrooms labs for, residential places for, fast enough. Texas State University has the largest relative space deficit of the state's larger universities. To, to meet its projected needs, the state system would have to add 1.4 million square feet for an increase of 72% just to Texas State to be an average. We've done our very best to focus on quality in the face of declining revenue and growing enrollment and these other challenges that I mentioned. Since 2010, the average tuition and fees at our four-year institutions have risen 44%, less than the state average, but still at a good clip. 
while this has been necessary, going forward, it simply won't be sustainable. Tuition and fees at our four institutions are at or above the average of peer institutions. You <coughs> see that Texas State, relative to peers, is at average. And we are 11% higher at Sam Houston than their peer group, 9% higher at Lamar than peer group, and 3% higher at Sol Ross than peer group. If we're good to be competitive, if we're to be affordable, we have to do everything in our power to slow the rate of tuition and fee increases going forward at all of our institutions. The policymakers who follow these trends know and understand the re direct relationship between our low funding and our tuition growth. So simultaneously, we in government affairs will work to increase the funding to this system by arguing for formula tweaks. The efficiencies that we have brought to you have been significant. 51 million in debt relief by refinancing over seven years, three and a half million annually in renegotiating our energy cost, 1.2 annually in savings for insurance premiums, 3.6% annually in savings in our e procurement programs, but we have to do more. That's not going to cut it. I'm encouraging our two-year institutions to look at shared services so that we pay a bit more for a purchasing manager who works for all three campuses instead of having one on each of the campuses. Any savings we have achieved has been eclipsed by declining state support, which will continue, skyrocketing Hazelwood costs, which I see no solution for in the near term, and increasing health costs. Given the importance of retention and persistence to achieving the aggressive 2020 enrollment and degree production goals that I have laid out, I have asked Dr. Hayek to work with the chief academic officers of every campus to understand better who leaves our campuses prior to completion and why. Why do they leave? What are our institutions currently doing about it? How aggressively are they hovering? over those students to make sure that they stay and find out how we can help and what more can and should be done both immediately and over the next several years to improve student retention and completion in our system. Enrollment solves a lot of problems. In my direct reports, the presidents and vice chancellors will be graded and evaluated annually on the success of their participation in reaching goals in the 2020 plan. And I strongly encourage the presidents and vice chancellors to evaluate their direct reports in the same way in that the 2020 plan has the means to get us through a retention, recruitment, enrollment, fundraising to get to our goals. We're in a constant state of change. Kodak, Sears, payphones, and taxi cabs didn't adapt, and as a result, they became or are becoming something obsolete. Universities and colleges across the nation are closing, not at a fast rate, but we don't want it to be us, and it won't be. Our mission is too important to jeopardize the future of the institutions and students they serve. I'm here to remind that the 2020 plan is something we will achieve and once achieved, many problems will have been avoided. And so with that, Madam Chair, thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to endeavor to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCall. Any questions, comments? We're just glad we have you, Dr. McCall, to <laughs> help us chart the, chart the course ahead. Thank you for that report. Our next order of business is the approval of the previous meeting's minutes. I move that the minutes of the quarterly Board of Regents meeting held on May 18th and 19th, 2017 be adopted. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Scott. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. 
We will now hear reports and motions from the committees. The committees met prior to the board meeting to consider proposed items in detail. I will now call on the chairs of the committees to present their reports to the full board. And first up is Academic Affairs with Regent Jaime Garza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Academic Affairs Committee met telephonically on Monday, August 7th, 2017. It was chaired by Chairman Salazar with committee members Regent Edwards and student Regent Tyra in, in attendance, as well as representatives from our institutions and system staff. All action and consent items were reviewed, discussed, and approved by the committee to be moved to the full board. I will now make a motion for approval of each of these items. Uh, Lamar University. I move that Lamar University be authorized to offer a 120-hour Bachelor of Science in Computer Game Development within the Department of Computer Science in the College of Arts and Sciences. This will be effective spring 2018 following notification to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the Commission on Colleges of Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. There's a motion, Regents. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Regent Amato. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I now move that Lamar University be authorized to offer a 30-hour STEM certified both face-to-face -face and online Master of Science program in Management Information Systems with an emphasis in enterprise systems within the Department of Information Systems and Analysis in the College of Business. This will be effective fall 2018 following approval from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the Commission on Colleges of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Tinsley. Um, any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm excited to move that Sam Houston State University be authorized to offer a degree program and associated new course additions leading to the Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine housed within the College of Osteopathic Medicine to be implemented upon final approval by the Texas State University System Board of Regents, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, the Commission on Osteopathic College Accreditation, and the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges with the first class to begin in fall 2020. There's a motion, I'll is there a second? It. Seconded by Regent Amato. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Congratulations, Dr. Hoy. Madam Chair, I move that Lamar State College Orange be authorized to award a certificate for able-bodied seamen. There's a motion, is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by, Re by Regent Amato. Any discussion? No, no, no Regent Scott. No, Scott. Regent Scott. Scott. Thank you. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I next move that Lamar State College Port Arthur be authorized to offer a degree program leading to the Associate of Applied Science with a major in drafting to be implemented upon final approval by the Texas State University System Board of Regents and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Williams. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. The final item is informational only and is the preliminary enrollment report for summer 2017. The certified enrollment report will be approved at the November meeting. Any remaining items are included in the consent agenda unless someone wishes to remove an item from consent. If not, this concludes the committee's report to the board, Madam Chair. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Garza. Next up is finance and audit, um, and we'll have Regent Alan Tinsley present. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the finance and audit committee met telephonically on August 10, 2017 to discuss finance and audit items included in today's agenda. I chaired the meeting and Regent Scott and Chairman Salazar participated. The Finance and Audit Committee considered all items and the committee agreed to move each item to today's meeting for consideration by the full board. The first item for consideration is to authorize final budget adjustments for fiscal year 
2017 for the Texas State University system. Madam Chair, I move that the system administration and components be authorized to transfer available revenue and expenditure balances, including general revenue as authorized by the General Appropriations Act to fund year-end adjustments to departmental budgets and to close the books for fiscal year 2017. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Williams. <coughs> Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. The second item for consideration is operating budgets for fiscal year 2018 for the system. At this time, I would like to call on Dr. Smith to provide a short summary of the budget highlights. Thank you, Regent Tinsley. Briefly, what's proposed is a FY18 operating budget that's 3.1% greater than the fiscal year 2017 version. The proposal includes major increases in resident instruction, institutional support and administration, and auxiliary enterprises. Revenue for the proposal is provided by increases in tuition and fees and sales and services, including auxiliaries. Funding does include a reduction of $7.9 million in state appropriations. As a side note, this will be the smallest annual operating budget percentage increase for the Texas State University system over the period 2013 through 2018. Regent Tinsley, that concludes my brief remarks unless there are questions. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Smith. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I move that the fiscal year 2018 operating budgets for the components of the Texas State University system be approved as shown in the board book beginning on page 102. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Montaigne. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. The next item for consideration is approval of investment policy for the system. Chairman Salazar, I move the investment policy for operating funds and endowment funds dated September 2017 be approved effective September 1, 2017, contingent upon the total book value of TSUS endowments being at least $150 million as of September 1, 2017. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Williams. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. The next item for consideration is Texas State University System approval for fiscal year 2018 audit plan. Madam Chair, I move that the fiscal year 2018 audit plan for the Texas State University System be approved. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Amato. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. The next two items on the agenda were for informational items. Texas State University System Statement of Changes in Fund Balance and Status of Implementation of Audit Recommendations. The final item for consideration is the consent agenda. Madam Chair, I move that the operating budget adjustments be scheduled for the board's consent agenda to be considered at that time. There's a motion um, on the table. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Scott. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion ha passes. Madam Chair, this concludes the Finance and Audit Committee's report. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next up is Vice Chairman Scott, Chairman of the Planning and Construction Committee. 
Tuesday afternoon, the Planning and Construction Committee met by telephone on Tuesday, August the 8th, 2017, and discussed the items on the Planning and Construction Agenda. I chaired the meeting, which was also attended by Committee Member Regent Williams, as well as Board Chairman Salazar and Student Regent Tyra. <coughs> Representatives of the system office and the component institutions were also present. The meeting was duly posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act. The committee has voted unanimously to recommend all agenda items for board approval. I present the committee recommendation on action items in the form of a motion. The first item on the agenda is the East Central Plant <coughs> Expansion Project at Sam Houston State University. Madam Chair, I move that the design development documents prepared by Kirksey Architecture of Houston, Texas for the East Central Plant Expansion Project at Sam Houston State University and the projected total project cost of $8,400,000 be approved to be funded by Texas State University System <laughs> Revenue Bonds in the amount of five million five hundred thousand dollars and higher education assistant fund in the amount of two million two nine hundred thousand dollars there's a motion is there a second 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 by regent williams any discussion if not all in favor aye, aye. any any opposed <laughs> the motion passes <laughs> The second item on the agenda is the University Master Plan for Texas State University. I'd like to ask President Trout to introduce this item and the presentation of the Master Plan. Thank you, Regent Scott. I think that most of you know that since January of 2016, we have been working on a campus master plan for 2017 to 2027. We have uh, engaged Smith Group, JJR, of Ann Arbor, Michigan, to lead us through this master planning process. Uh, and they, in turn, um, engaged a group of sub-consultants to help them. This is a master plan for the San Marcos campus, one for the Round Rock campus, and one for our science, technology, and advanced research park. So there's three plans embedded here. Uh, and I want to particularly thank Regent Williams, uh, who began as our local chair and a member of the committee that directed the master plan and stayed with us uh, throughout the process. We really appreciate your engagement and the fact that you came to San Marcos so many times to be there in person. Thank you. Meetings, um, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to introduce um, one of the principals of Smith Group, JJR, Doug Kozma, who will present the master plan. Doug? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Trout. Um, you have the content in front of you. Um, given the time of day and the length of this, I want to abridge my comments. Um, so we'll begin at the top. Um, this has been a great journey, um, and I'd like to talk about the power and importance of physical master plan. So this is a response, it's a physical response, it's a 10 year response uh, for the growth and change at Texas State. I want to emphasize that this is a document that you have in front of you in its entirety that is intended to be flexible to guide decision making over the next decade and beyond. So we embarked in a multi-phase process as not uncommon in master planning. This one did stretch uh, 18 plus months, we had a lot of opportunity to engage a wide constituency, not only in the community, but of course across the campus enterprise. We would like to reiterate uh, our thanks for uh, Regent Williams' participation. You've been a trooper through, through this journey. It was a fantastic uh, voyage. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge Peter Graves from the system office, who was on uh, uh, beat with us throughout the course of this, this planning exercise. And of course, Dr. Trout, thank you for your leadership in this exercise. We couldn't have done it without you. And Nancy Nussbaum was the glue behind the master planning enterprise. So a couple of thank yous that are uh, quite worthy and publicly acknowledged. We also had a website, by the way, if you haven't seen these kinds of things, it's fantastic. There was a wide range of participation. This really is the voice of the people. So although I'm speaking on behalf of a large team, uh, there's been a lot of transparency in this process. The goals out outlined in front of you are very important. They are thematically about academics, research, 
the place and the student experience for the San Marcos footprint, similar for the Round Rock Enterprise and for the Science, Technology, and Advanced Research Park, I'll refer to it as STAR, moving forward from here. Um, we really wanted to reinforce the idea of innovation and bringing ideas to market, and I'll talk more about that as the presentation unfolds. Uh, Dr. Trout and her team is being modest. Uh, Texas State has a fantastic tradition of planning, as you well know. This is all of the activities that have been completed since 2005. There are also a number of activities that I'm sure you're aware of that are happening right now. There's a lot of, of movement afoot at Texas State, and we're looking out for the next decade of change. And the following slides begin to articulate how we came to these conclusions. Um, our work began with a really, really rigorous, multidisciplinary um, analytic exercise that really underpins the master plan. Um, there's a lot of detail behind here, but suffice it to say, uh, we under, undertook um, this data analysis to really get to sound recommendations. Some of the highlights that came from this analytic uh, exercise were echoed, Mr. Chancellor, by your comments. Texas State University has um, the highest utilization of space in the state of Texas. They have the largest deficit of learning space in the state of Texas and have simply been unable, unable, unable to keep up in terms of square footage per student in the last decade. This is something that the master plan seeks to address. We also undertook a very interesting and important benchmarking exercise with the emerging research university status that Texas State has been granted. We benchmarked not only peers in the state, but peers out of state um, to look at trends in research. That all yielded a really exciting research trajectory, which I'll highlight in just a minute. One of the problem statements that was posed to the planning team and the community at large was, do we have enough room to expand the footprint of Texas State University? Uh, there's a lot of topography, there's a lot of vegetation. We undertook a pretty interesting analysis to uncover. There actually are um, developable places on campus, underutilized built assets that need to be rethought, and came to approximately 70 acres of developable land uh, that are challenging, but are opportunities for the future. Uh, the planning team focused then, um, of that 70, on 25 acres that are central to the academic core, so they're walkable, uh, and they are easily accessible in terms of transit and parking. So the remaining comments in this afternoon's presentation do vector more heavily around some of these opportunities for growth and change on campus. The same kind of exercise was conducted, of course, for the Round Rock Enterprise in terms of the current assets and opportunities for development and change. And of course, the Star Park. Uh, Star Park, as you know, is about 20 miles, excuse me, three miles outside of the San Marcos footprint, and the Round Rock campus is about 20 miles north of Austin. So at a high level, uh, to summarize the sort of programmatic kit of parts, and we talked uh, with Dr. Trout a little bit about this throughout the, the, the weeks and, and leading up to today, the planning trajectory that we sought to uh, achieve was a 1.5% undergraduate and 3% uh, graduate growth, migrating essentially from approximately 38,000 students to more than 46,000 students. That becomes the underpinning of the master plan. Uh, in parallel to that, we set, I think, a very responsible 5% growth trajectory for the research enterprise um, with the task of attempting to get from 47 to $86 million in uh, research. And that, in a, in, in a nutshell, is essentially adding um, additional principal investigator faculty and, of course, lab and lab support space for those faculty to thrive. As the Chancellor mentioned, approximately 1.4 million square feet of space uh, were identified as uh, needed and opportunistic on the campus. You can see on the left the prioritized list of where the deficiencies are greatest in terms of teaching, classroom space, office space, research space, et cetera. Uh, that plays out about 80% of the need or more at the San Marcos footprint and about 20% of the need at the Round Rock footprint. <coughs> Academics and research, student life. So nearly 100% of the students at Texas State University that are freshmen live on campus. The trajectory changes in this master plan when we introduce the idea of having 33% of the returning sophomore class live on campus. The result for the master plan and for the campus is important. Uh, we will be seeking to renovate additional beds on campus and to add bed count to the fabric of the campus. That's essentially what this is summarizing. For the San Marcos campus, uh, this is sort of a summation of the opportunities 
about a million two square feet of academic and research enterprise, additional beds, additional dining, additional infrastructure needs, and of course, considerations for additional parking as we add these students, faculty, and staff to campus. Programmatically, the Round Rock campus has a similar story. Um, as you know, I'll describe the migration of the health professions from San Marcos to Round Rock. That in part is driving the space need behind the enterprise in Round Rock. I'll articulate that more in just a moment. And then for the Star Park, programmatically, in summary, we're looking to add space for our partners, industry partners, um, and those who are doing innovation, research, and um, entrepreneurship. Okay, that's the backstory. The remainder of my comments are talking about the future state, which arguably is among the, the more important parts of the message that I need to communicate to you today. It begins with the San Marcos vision of framework, an armature, if you will, starting from the center. Um, we're seeking to really energize the academic core, concentrate our activities, bringing the activities of the East Campus and the West Campus closer together to the core. Um, there are a couple of sort of important uh, movements that we're going to be talking about in this afternoon's conversation. You have this lovely East-West Mall. We need to pronounce that. We also need to introduce some connectors into San Marcos proper. They too are growing. And we need to connect underdeveloped parts of campus, particularly to the West. And I'll articulate that more in the next few slides. So to orient you, we'll be looking at a handful of maps. North is up. Uh, Sesame Drive, for those of you who know, know the campus, is at the top of the diagram. On the far left is Aquarina, excuse me, on the far right is Aquarina Springs Drive as it migrates out to I-35. You can see Spring Lake featured centrally on the campus to for orientation. Um, you'll see the color coding in the lower right. I don't need to go through that, but we're identifying opportunities in a 10-year horizon and a 10 to 20-year horizon through the remainder of this afternoon's presentation. We'll be focusing on three primary areas uh, of interest. I'll migrate through each of the different neighborhoods and talk about the opportunities for change within each of them, starting on the left with the science and engineering uh, neighborhood and precinct. So for those of you that have been to San Marcos, you'll notice that there is a big building coming online. It's called Ingram Hall. It's the engineering uh, building. That's identified in the lower right-hand portion of this picture. The first stone has already been cast in terms of the power of this, this neighborhood as it migrates into the future. But we want to protect the students. We want to uh, encourage the students to have safe travels across the campus. As a, as a place that's going to get more energy, we're recommending that Comanche be uh, a candidate for a pedestrian overpass, a lot like the existing pedestrian overpass we have, a little to the north of this diagram. So what we're recommending, and you can see business in the foreground left with the connector over to Ingram Hall for the safety of our students, and really to knit these two parts of campus together. It will be in part the academic frontier for Texas State University. So we want to set in motion the appropriate connective tissue for this part of campus. Looking at it differently, hovering mostly above the library, looking west to this emerging part of campus, you can see those opportunities to, to connect the fabric of campus from east to the central core. We're also looking at um, what happens after the first decade of change. And so when I toggle to the next slide, you'll see we're thinking creatively about how to best use the land assets at Texas State, particularly the area that's around the president's residence and is surrounded by the physical sciences. What's articulated in this diagram is a beyond 2027 idea to really reinforce and allow the full execution of the engineering disciplines on Texas State's campus married to the physical sciences. Super important in American higher education, super important opportunity for Texas State University to capitalize on. One of the things that's going to need to be considered in that decade and beyond is the opportunity to relocate the president's residence. So we've begun thinking about that. Second topic, second neighborhood of discussion is the hilltop. So for those of you that know the campus, this is arguably the largest underutilized existing land asset that they have. It's full of housing right now. Uh, it's old housing stock. It is low density housing stock. And this is a really, really big opportunity for the university to introduce uh, an academical village of mixed uses, and I want to describe what that means. On the left is the existing condition. On the right is an opportunity for the first five years of development with a strategic housing intervention on the hilltop. So more density, more bed count. As we look past the five years, on the left is an opportunity to introduce an academic and research footprint 
to uh, attenuate some of the spatial deficiencies I articulated at the outset. And then on the right is sort of the full uh, development of the hilltop, including additional research and academic footprints. We've diagrammed that in three dimensions, so it's a little easier to understand. So for those of you that have been here, this is a pretty significant transformation for the campus as we look past the 10-year horizon. The buildings with the white roofs for reference are academic and research opportunities. The building with the slope roof are opportunities for expansion of the housing enterprise. Uh, the reason we're pausing and showing you these renderings is because of the importance of place. Uh, this particular view is looking from the, under, the undergraduate uh, education center, looking up the Guadalupe corridor to the hilltop. If I were to turn around, you'd see downtown behind us. This really is the connective tissue between the campus and the community. I want to make sure we got it right. And finally, I'd like to conclude the neighborhood conversation with the Performing Arts District. This is an important part of campus, arguably among the more front door parts of campus along University Drive. What's being discussed in this diagram and what I want to articulate for you is the importance of co-locating sister facilities. So the round building, the theater center, uh, there's an opportunity to recast music and to connect it to the performing arts edition. In addition to expanding the Lantana and Butler footprints for housing. So we're really talking about a community of learning for those students in this area of campus. Very exciting. It's on the Concho Green, again in terms of placemaking in terms of uh, the importance of scale and place and character. These kinds of things really uh, separate Texas State University. So we're very excited to be presenting these, these concepts to you. I'm gonna take a breath. The last part of the slides here are system diagrams. I'll bridge my comments, just keeping it to the highlights. This is an accumulation of the recommendations kind of all on one sheet of paper, so to speak. So the buildings identified in dark blue are the opportunities in the next decade for academic and research expansion. I've articulated most all of them. Likewise, uh, the residence life expansion opportunities in the next decade are really in two spots. I mentioned the Hilltop and the Performing Arts District. Uh, the student life pieces, which I didn't articulate, I wanna pause here. There is an opportunity to expand student health on campus, much needed, expand the LBJ Student Center, which is already underway. Uh, and the fourth piece on there is the opportunity for alum, an alumni center, a very exciting opportunity next to the Jower Center on campus. Some of the highlights uh, in the next decade of change. Systematically, we wanted to make sure we addressed the student life piece of not only recreation, but competitive athletics. Uh, uh, the university's done a great job investing, as you know, in competitive athletics. There are modest upgrades to the facilities as opportunities in the next decade. The thing that has the students and the faculty and the staff very excited is the transformation of the golf asset into a dedicated recreation venue for your students. Uh, this is really important, and we're glad this is underway. Finally, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about parking. It's a little uh, like handling a lightning bolt, as you know, on campus. Um, the important things to communicate to you are twofold. One, the university continues to take small, underutilized parking assets out of the core and two, move them to perimeter parking garage assets. And that's what's being diagrammed on the screen here. Our three placeholders for structured parking, you can see them on the east, west, and core of campus. We wanna make sure that these are placeholders for change should the demand be necessitated. Um, also connected to these are the shuttle system, which you know is uh, exceedingly robust, exceeding 30,000 students da daily. Lastly, building renovation uh, candidates, these are renovations that are noticeable. There are also a whole series of infrastructure improvements that one would argue are not noticeable to the, by the bypasser, but are equally as important for the function of the facilities. And coming with that are demolition candidates. And frankly, most of them, when you get a chance to study this, are aged, tired uh, housing assets. That's really, really what most of the demolition candidates see on campus is in the next decade. Okay. Um, with that, there's a whole story that can be talked about. Infrastructure highlights. Uh, water on campus is a big deal. So potable water in terms of well and water storage will be important in the next decade. Critical infrastructure for research. Redundancy in the electrical network, additional chilled water, uh, and improvement to the central plants are important and will be necessitated in the next decade. So this is the illustrative, pulling it all together in the next decade. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't look out to the next decade and beyond, which is the 2027 vision. So a very exciting vision of the future state. 
The last parts of this, I promise, will go more quickly. Uh, the Round Rock Enterprise, equally as important to the San Mar Marcos Enterprise, has a clear vision, and its vision at present is migrating the health professions from San Marcos to the Round Rock footprint. You'll notice an A and a B and a C. The A and the B are the first two tranches of academic unit movement. So A um, is intended to bring over, you have them in front of you, uh, physical therapy, and the other two uh, academic units. Uh, in the 10-year plan, there's also uh, an idea to bring over the remaining four academic units so that all of the health professions are centrally located on the Round Rock Enterprise. We, of course, looked out beyond 2027, understood the importance of infrastructure, roads, and additional parking assets as the campus matures and changes. And then finally this afternoon, I'd like to conclude the comments with the importance of this asset called Star Park. Uh, this is a big deal for the university. It's a big deal for the community. It's a big deal for Central Texas. Uh, there's a couple of key things to note here. Uh, there are five-year plans, which are articulated on the screen, to introduce a structures lab, uh, additional space for our partners and entrepreneurs, uh, and to bring on the other two assets, uh, which you can see on the screen. Those will mature in the 10-year plan to full build-out, so we're prepared for the parking infrastructure and land use requirements. And then we wanted to also, like we've been doing throughout the, the entirety of this plan, look past the 10-year vision and see what is possible. What's articulated for you is a very exciting uh, vision of an urban research enterprise uh, that, that basically creates a main street of research. Uh, your partners and your donors are very interested in this kind of thing. It's how ideas come to market. And so we've developed all kinds of guidelines for how you can get this done, including placemaking guidelines. We're terribly excited about this. Uh, let me conclude my comments again with a thanks to you and all those that have participated in the master planning process. This has been a fantastic journey, and I believe Texas State University is on the right path for the next decade and beyond. Thank you for your attention. Are there questions? Any questions? Nice. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairman, uh, if there are no other questions or anything, I move that the 2017-2027 University Master Plan for Texas State University prepared by the firm Smith Group, JJR of Ann Arbor, Michigan be approved and the university be authorized to make all necessary filings based on the adopted University Master Plan and the Texas Higher Education with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Williams. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. The third Very item exciting. on the agenda is the addition of two projects to the Capital Improvements Program. I move that the Don Sanders baseball renovations project and the Bowers Stadium renovation project at Sam Houston State University be added to the 2018-2023 TSUS Capital Improvement Program. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Seconded by Regent Amato. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Madam Chairman, the remaining items on the planning and construction agenda the August planning and construction report is an informational item. Uh, Madam Chair, this, this concludes the committee's report. Thank you, Regent Scott. Our next committee is the Rules and Regulations, and Regent Alan Tinsley will be presenting the report um, given the absence of Regent Reeser. Madam Chair, Vice Chairman Scott, Regents and Chancellor. <coughs> All the board typically considers revisions to its rules and regulations in May of each year. Occasionally, as in the present case, legislative actions and other imperatives require changes at other times in the year. As acting chairman of the Rules and Regulations Committee, I convened the committee's telephonic meeting at 201 on August 10, 2017. Committee member Regent Edwards was also present and partic participating, as were Board Chair Salazar, the Chancellor, 
the vice chancellor and general counsel, the presidents <coughs> or their designees, the system director of audits and analysis, the deputy vice chancellor for finance, and other members of the system administrative office staff. After considering the proposed changes, the committee voted to recommend all of the submitted changes to, for consideration by the full board. I'll now ask the vice chancellor and general counsel to discuss proposed rules changes with us. Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Committee Chair. Um, Regents, there are three rules changes. The first is on page 413 of your agenda book. And, uh, and say current policy currently authorizes noting disciplinary matters on a student's transcript. Once that matter had been concluded and the student had been adjudicated uh, to be culpable, what this rule does is it makes it mandatory to do that notation. The second rule deals with conflicts of interest in contracts that come before the board. That rule will appear on page 414 of your agenda book. And this is mandated by legislation that passed this last session. Currently, uh, for a region to have a conflict of interest under the education code, the, the person, uh, on a matter before the board, the person would have to, among other things, have a 10% interest in that matter. The legislature has now uh, narrowed or increased, however you want to view it, to 1%. 1% makes, makes it a conflict. That's uh, statutorily mandated. The third rule is a long one. You've seen it before. This has gone through uh, several times at the board. It's uh, the Texas uh, State University System Sexual Misconduct Policy and Procedures. And this has two general changes. The first set of changes are mandated by Senate bills uh, 968 and 969, which passed this last session, and principally those basically provide good faith reporting of sexual misconduct is protected. There, there are some protections is, is for, for students who are reporting as well as for students that are uh, being accused. I won't go into those unless you really you, uh, want to uh, hear the specific details, but these are statutorily mandated. There are also some additional changes that uh, the Vice President for Student Affairs principally who work with this are aware of. Uh, this has been from the inception three years ago, a system-wide effort of many people. And what they are essentially are operational and, and procedural changes, uh, changes of clarification to make the process work a little better as we work through that. Now, those are the three you have, I believe, Mr. Chair uh, Tinsley, yes. uh, one motion to cover all three. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to address them or you can go into greater detail. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Gomez. Yes, sir. <coughs> Madam Chair, I move that the proposed revisions to the board's rules and regulations be approved. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Williams. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> the motion passes. Next up, thank you, Regent Tinsley. Next up is government relations, and the chair is Regent Montaigne. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Vice Chancellor Sean Cunningham is going to come up and give us a report. Pierce must have some startling information, <laughs> late breaking information. Thank you, Regent Montaigne, Madam yes. Chair, Regents. Uh, good afternoon. Since my last comprehensive legislative report at the May board meeting, I'm pleased to announce that I have very little to share with you with respect to legislative action affecting our system following the conclusion of the regular session and subsequent special session that ended just only two days ago. 
This has the making for my shortest presentation on record, so let's start the timer now. <laughs> I'll start by updating you on a few pending items I mentioned during my last presentation of particular interest to two of, uh, three of our schools. Uh, you may recall that legislation was needed to address Lamar's concern for delivering their advanced educator certification program uh, due to a change in rules that were adopted by the State Board of Educator Certification. Representatives uh, Dave Phelan and Senator Creighton were instrumental in passing the legislation. Secondly, uh, Lamar State College Port Arthur and Lamar State College Orange were the only institutions among their peers that were not eligible to receive JET funding grants from the Texas Workforce Commission that aid local communities and businesses with equipment, tools necessary for the training of the local workforce in technology related field. Thanks to Representative Joe Deschatel and Senator Creighton, the bill finally passed. I'm proud to report that both bills became effective immediately upon the governor's signature in June. And I'd like to thank everyone from our schools who traveled to Austin to testify and the countless hours spent developing the supporting materials for the legislation. Next, I turn your attention to what passed during the special session. Lawmakers were initially asked to pass legislation needed to keep five state agencies in operation and then to address a longer list of proposals from everything for rest from restroom regulations to local tree ordinances. The governor put forth a total of 20 issues for consideration, 10 passed. The items that passed related to, and I won't get into the specifics, but I'll just uh, hit the, 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 the topics. Sunset legislation, teacher retirement benefits, school finance reform, limits on local tree regulations, abortion insurance, abortion reporting, do not resuscitate protections, mail-in ballot fraud, maternal mortality, municipal annexation. I'm happy to furnish any background information on those issues uh, upon request, but since the items were not higher education related, I'd like to now turn our attention to the federal update. Pierce just distributed some copies of our federal report, and I'll let you read it at your leisure as it is a bit more comprehensive and gives greater detail of upcoming congressional activity, uh, as well as specific TSUS federal activity that our president's provost and research officers will be interested in. Um, I'd like to use this time to mention here that Chancellor McCall, Dr. Hayek, and our two-year president and myself will be in D.C. in early October for targeted meetings and look forward to reporting our progress at the November board meeting. Uh, turn your attention to our interim outreach. The system's governmental relations team looks forward to continuing our outreach efforts and listening to her during the next year and a half. In our ongoing efforts to visit all of our campuses, to better understand firsthand what our campuses' needs will be heading into the upcoming congressional terms and leading up to the, state, the next state legislative session. We will continue to work on ways to get members of the legislature and senior legislative staff, on, staff onto our campuses for targeted tours of our, our campuses and to also better understand the importance of our non-formula item funding that exists throughout the system, uh, which will be in focus during the interim legislative uh, meetings uh, held in, in Austin. We look forward to updating <coughs> on these matters and with that, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. This concludes my presentation. Open any questions. Thank you, Sean. Just a good job you and your team. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. As always, great job. <coughs> Madam Chairman, that concludes the report. Thank you, Regent Montaigne. The board will now consider contracts, miscellaneous, and personnel items. And first up is contracts. First item under contracts is from Sol Ross State University regarding a quarter horse donation agreement. The establishment of the Mrs. Elaine Conger Gist Endowment, I hope I got that right, and gift acknowledgement. Regents, this motion has been revised since the board book was published, and you have a revised motion at your desk, and I believe Carol is also putting the motion up on the screen. Dr. Kibler, would you please present this item? rather unusual but also extremely exciting opportunity so it bears a little bit of explanation. As many of you know the American Quarter Horse is a horse that won the American West, also known as the Great American Ranch Horse. The Quarter Horse is legendary in their diversity of skills and rodeo events, ranching events and other things. They're renowned for their temperament. If you ever want to put your child on a horse for the first time, the best pick is a quarter horse. The American Quarter Horse has clearly been the utility player in horsing, ranching, and rodeo worlds for over 150 years. 
This breed of horse could perform every duty on the ranch, excel in every event at the rodeo, and outrace any other horse a quarter mile. This is a story about a rancher and a horseman named Fred Gist. Mr. Gist became concerned in the 1970s that the true foundation of quarter horses, those that are direct descendants of the legendary sires that began the American quarter horse breed, were in fact a vanishing breed. Through time, there had become a growing desire to develop horses that had highly specified skills rather than the broad range of skills that the American Quarter Horse was known for. So Mr. Gist began a process of traveling the country to find and acquire quarter horses that had a very high percentage bloodlines tracing back to his original foundation sires. He brought them to his wagon wheel ranch in Lomita, Texas and began what is now known as a legendary breeding program that resulted in the Wagon Wheel Ranch having one of the largest and most prized herds of high percentage bloodlines of foundation quarter horses in the entire country. Well, Mr. Gist passed away suddenly and unexpectedly in 2009. His wife Elaine and son John have carried on his work since, but recently made the decision that the time had come to pass this work on to others who could carry it into the future. Their challenge was it was not their desire to simply sell the horses individually or the entire herd. That would have been easy. These are, in fact, highly prized foundation quarter horses. Their vision was to find a way to preserve the work and the legacy of Fred Gist by finding a place for the entire herd and a way to continue the breeding, research, and educational programs that have developed through the decades around this famous herd of horses. His family and Soro State University began talking last year. It was a perfect match. In Solros, the Gist family found a faculty and an institution that had a history, a legacy for the commitment and passion needed for this work. The Gist family dropped all discussion with others and focused their entire attention on developing a plan with Solros that would allow the entire herd to be donated to the university document you have before you is the result of months of meticulous work. We particularly want to thank Fernando Gomez, who's been with us every step of the way in developing this highly unusual agreement. The agreement sets forth a plan for how this legendary herd and the breeding program and all that comes with it could move to Solaro State University. The vision is huge. Considered in its entirety, this would clearly be the single biggest academic and programmatic initiative in the history of our university. Acquisition of this herd would be a game changer for Sol Ross. It would position us as an industry leader in the equine science world and was result in one of the largest registered herds of American quarter horses in the entire country to be located right here at Sol Ross. Here's the challenge. The estimated cost to appropriately manage and care for this herd and conduct the associated research and breeding programs is about $600,000 a year. The herd itself has the capacity to generate about $100,000 a year in sales and other activity. So it'll take a major fundraising campaign to raise the needed $15 million to be placed in an endowment that will generate the necessary earnings to maintain this herd in perpetuity, because that would be our plan. We don't want to accept this unless we can maintain this program into the future. The Gist family is committed to taking the lead in raising the needed funds, so Ross would be a part of that. The first $1 million raised would be invested in the necessary infrastructure to house such a herd of prized horses. So Ross has already committed a half a million dollars in heat funds to immediately launch highest priority needed infrastructure. So if money is raised quickly, and it may be some of it, we would be prepared to begin taking those horses at that time. Fencing, pins, various things that are needed immediately to, to house these. The boards that are up here give you a little bit of demonstration of the concepts of how these funds would in fact transform the equine facilities at Solaro State University, as you see depictions of uh, fenced in pasture lands and other things, these are all reflecting the lands right here on our campus. If we in fact got the entire herd, which is 160 actual registered, named, numbered American uh, Foundation American Quarter Horses, approximately 95 additional 
uh, young stock, three years and younger, and some additional mares, it's, it's 250 horses. Even that many cannot be accommodated on all this. We have other land, and we're even in discussions about leasing other land, where some of those would be accommodated. But the immediate focus would be on the lands that we already have on our campus, but they need to be appropriately fenced and configured to house these horses. Uh, the remaining funds would go into an endowment that would fund operating costs, faculty positions, and staff positions. One of the things that's in the agreement that at the point where sufficient money is raised, we would create an endowed professorship. The Elaine Conger Gist, that's Fred Gist's widow. The Elaine Conger Gist Endowed Professor of Equine Science at Solaro State University would be a million dollar endowment into that endowed professorship. So that, that would be part of that, but we would also need to hire a herdsman, an additional faculty member. We would do a lot of this work with students that we would expect them to track here that would be highly interested in working with such a prized uh, herd of horses. So the agreement includes a carefully crafted schedule that shows how many horses Solros would be able to take and care for according to how much money is raised. It's in phases, so that's why it's different than most agreements you see. Uh, and I'm skimming across the surface. The ancillary benefit of this for Sol Ross in this entire initiative would be allow us to begin a process to return our legendary rodeo program to its former prominent status. As you missed, if you know, intercollegiate rodeo started at Sol Ross State University in 1949. Unfortunately, we've fallen behind many of our competitors due to limited resources. And so, uh, this initiative would allow not only stock of horses, but would attract students that would want to come here and would just elevate that program. Some of the things you see on the renderings here, especially the one on the far right, shows some of the facilities that would not only be devoted to the educational research programs of the uh, managing this herd, but also some, some facilities that we would hope develop related to rodeo, which would have to be raised separately. Because as you know, we can't spend state funds or HEAF money on rodeo. Rodeo is an extracurricular activity. So acquisition of these amazing rodeo horses as well would bring stock to Sol Ross and attack, attract the best and uh, most talented rodeoers in addition to scholars and researchers that would want to come and work with this breeding program, the associated research, and the things that would happen if Sol Ross had possession of this extraordinary herd of horses. Um, so these boards reflect both academic and research facilities as well as rodeo facilities. And we've passed out a program that you have in front of you that says Wagon Wheel Ranch on it. You see that. What that is is the program that is, it has already been produced for the production sale that happens in about three weeks. Uh, rep myself personally and several other representatives of Sol Ross will be there for the two days or so that this is going on. You can just flip through that book and get a sense of the quality of this operation and the magnitude of this and the significance of it. It's at this event is where the vision for the future will be laid out. In other words, it will be revealed to them there that the Gist family has, in fact, selected Sol Ross State University as the future home of this herd. The only thing that stands between now and the achievement of that goal is raising the money. And so this particular, uh, so anyway, that will be significant. Many potential donors will be there at this location that will be very interested and intrigued by this seems very fitting and appropriate to the Gist family that it be an academic and higher education institution versus a private entity that would carry on this research, this breeding program, the educational programs, and all the things that happen associated with that. If this plan is able to come together as we envision, this particular event that you see laid out in this program would in fact be happening in the future at Sol Ross State University here on our campus and on our property and we would be producing something like this and inviting some of the most uh, influential American Quarter Horse folks from around the country and beyond to come to our campus to participate in the event as they do at the ranch now. So much of the work and the effort on behalf of the part of our faculty and our administration and staff has taken place to get us where we are here. Dr. Rob Kanukin is here, I believe, somewhere, the dean of our college. He has been a significant part of that. And Dr. Rebecca Slam, who is our equine horse expert, has been here. Rick Worley's here as well. He's done a lot of work on this also. 
Canuck and his plan, particularly probably chuckling at all the misstatements I made. I'm not a horse expert. I'm far from that. But they are. But I have one thing right that I know for sure. This may be the biggest and most exciting academic, educational, research, and programmatic and student-focused initiative in the history of this university. We encourage your approval of this agreement so we can embark on this work. It will be hard work to uh, raise the money necessary to bring this vision to reality. So I obviously uh, encourage your support. Thank you very much for allowing me to. And I'll answer any questions if you have them about this. Any no questions? My equine expertise is very low. <laughs> you make the most of your revenue through the sale of the, the horses or the breeding? Or well, for instance, that program is their annual production sale where they most of the money that's generated is this annual sales of the herd. So they'll sell X number of horses and yes. you count on that for your They've been able to maintain the herd at about this size. Fred Gist at one time had nearly a thousand quarter horses, but he began in the latter years of his life to begin to bring his herd down to about the size it is now. Uh, the family was continuing some of those sales at the beginning, but then they realized we need to stop doing that and maintained about the size they have now because if they sold them all off, suddenly 40 years of work, his legacy would be lost of trying to breed these uh, pure, pure blood uh, Foundation American Quarter Horses. So that's their desire, is to place this entire herd at a place where they will continue the breeding and the research necessary to keep it going. So that number is the number they sell in order to maintain the size of that herd about the size it is now. That's where the estimated $100,000 of annual revenue comes from. I'm sure it goes up or down a little each year depending on the success of their sale. Other questions you get for me? Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Kibler. Regents, is there a motion? Make it. Yes, sir. I can't read that. There's, there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? OK, I'll second. 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 Seconded by Regent Amato, uh, by Regent um, Williams. Um, any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Kibler. All remaining items in the contract section have been moved to the consent agenda, but Dr. Gomez is here to answer any questions if you should have any questions about these contracts. Next order of business is personnel, and the personnel reports may be found on the consent agenda. Next up is miscellaneous items. And the first item is from Sam Houston State University regarding the naming of Athletics Administrative Offices and the Learning Enhancement Center. Regents, this is a walk-on item. It was received too late to be included in the board book. You each have a copy at your, at your desk. And Carol also has it on the screen. Dr. Hoyt, would you like to present this item, please? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, Chair Salazar, uh, what this is is uh, we had acquired a um, property on campus, uh, actually it was a strip mall, and looking for the best purpose, uh, we really have um, our Maverick Field House is overloaded from an office standpoint and um, training facilities and stuff for our athletics program. Um, so I'm pleased to say that we asked Wood Forest Bank to provide us with a million and a half to renovate that facility for offices and um, uh, training and nutrition center and, um, for our student athletes. And so you'll see that, that the request is being made for that gift to name that for the Wood Forest Bank um, uh, Athletes Athletics Center. So um, that would, would be my request. Regents, any questions? If not, is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that Sam Houston State University be authorized to name the facilities in which athletics administration offices and the Learning Enhancement Center will be located as the Wood Forest Bank Athletic Center. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Williams. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. <coughs> Next item is from Sol Ross State University 
Dr. Kibler will present Saul Ross's revised strategic plan, strategies for the second century 2017-2022. Dr. Kibler. We have this booklet. I'll just make this very quick. The development of this strategic plan was a year and a half long process engaged in by hundreds of members of our Sol Ross community and, and beyond. Uh, page three in the plan provided the inspiration that guided the development of this plan. The first priority was the development of statements that demonstrate who we are, our vision, our mission, and the values that guide everything we do. And then there's discussion of the unique environment in which, in which we operate and how we strategically respond and plan to respond to that. Page eight begins the listing of our goals and our objectives. So those are all laid out. Um, when I met with the steering committee at the beginning of this process, I only made one demand because it was their job to really work on the content and, and bring that back. And regardless of the specific strategic goals and objectives that were ultimately identified, we had to have a plan that was measurable that allowed us to assess our progress along the way. Our previous strategic plan did not have that. That's why we initiated this process primarily. Assessment methods were developed for every single objective that will allow us to produce an annual report card on how we're doing during the five years of this plan. We developed a strategic plan implementation plan to go with that and appointed a strategic plan implementation coordinator that will assure that this document remains a living, working guide to our work over the next five years. So that's just a quick summary of what this is. Our request, our request is your endorsement of this plan as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kibler. Regents, any questions or comments? If not, do I hear a motion? Madam Chair, I move the Sol Ross State University be authorized to update its strategic plan to reflect its current stature as a comprehensive master's degree granting multi-campus university providing on-site and distance education with a focus on academic research and artistic excellence, targeted recruitment, maximize retention and increase graduation rates, strengthen financial base recruitment, development, and retention of valuable faculty and staff, and enhancing unified image of the university. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Tinsley. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Our next item is from Texas State University regarding the naming of 1921 Old Ranch Road 12 building. Dr. Trout. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is a, a very happy day for us to bring this motion to you because we are asking to name one of our facilities for a retired professor and former chair of the computer science department. And I think whenever uh, someone who knows you as well as Grady Early knows Texas State University uh, gives uh, as much as he has given, and to date he's given over $3 million to the university and he has a, a planned gift of another million dollars. Uh, I think that, that shows his belief in the university. He has been a real fan of forensics anthropology, uh, and as you know, you recently approved our going forward with the PhD in applied anthropology. So this is a building that we bought in 2015. Uh, it's a building and it's associated with uh, 13 acres of land, which is something we can talk about at another time. Uh, so we're bringing here, we've renovated the building. It was a, an old shoe uh, warehouse. And we're bringing this to you as a renovated building, asking for permission to put Grady Early's name on it. Very good. Any questions or comments? I would just make the comment that I know of no other retired instructors ever given that much to any university I've ever heard of. So I, I just want to forward this motion with, with great enthusiasm. Regents, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Regent Garza. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. The remaining action item on the miscellaneous agenda has been moved to the Friday agenda. 
All other remaining items on the miscellaneous agenda, the gift report, and the holiday schedule may be found on the consent agenda. Couple announcements, or one announcement. If you're attending tonight's dinner, please be in the hotel lobby by 6 p.m. We may need to change that. <laughs> 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 we may not go Please back to the hotel now, I'm told. <laughs> well, I'm asking. No, I don't. I don't think there's a need. So, uh, we'll just. Because we would be coming back over. So, are we, so we'll be staying here. Carol, I'm looking at you for guidance. Okay. While you're doing that, I just want to say that this has been an enormously productive day, and even though it seems that we go through some of our items fairly quickly, it, it should not be indicative of um, the, the respect. We have enormous respect for the work that all of you do, um, so we thank you for all that you do for, for this system and for each of your institutions. Very productive day. Thank you. So we will be going to dinner as soon as we finalize our meeting. And if there is no further business, we will recess for the day and reconvene an open session tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. For the record, the time is 5.34 p.m. Thank you. That was the longest. We've never executive session.